I'm very, very, very uh, excited to introduce our next panel um, with our beloved moderator of the Western Diocese, Diran Avagyan. Uh, Diran uh, is joining me now. There he is. And uh, this, this panel discussion is going to be one uh, that does deal with chaos and calamity, as I was previously mentioning. I think more than ever, that message that love never fails truly applies to this panel discussion, which is faith in action, our response to humanitarian crisis caused by the war in Artsakh. I'm going to give up the panel to Diran, and uh, we'll take it from there. Uh, but joining us in this next panel, we will also have um, some beloved folks from all across uh, the U.S. By name, I'll mention uh, Andrew Garibian, Mariam Garabedian, Deacon Kevin Kastekian, Deacon Ohan Kilisian, Deacon Christafur Mosesian, Karin Yeni Komshian, and Deacon Avak Zakarian. Happy to see a panel of uh, all these deacons and participants of the one body of Christ alike. Thank you for that, Levon. I think uh, I think um, Tiran will uh, will be joining here in just a few seconds. Wonderful. So in the meantime, they get us. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you guys are stretching, you know, not staying in one spot for too long. You know, what was very um, interesting and resonated to me, Levon, um, when you were talking about repetition and practice, um, there is a quote and um, this quote says, practice does not make perfect, but practice makes permanent. And I think oftentimes um, as human beings, we tend to shy away from practice and tend to shy away from repetition because we know that we can never be perfect. But I think it's important to also change that mindset and say, I'm not gonna be perfect, but I will be permanent. And so um, Deacon David also touched, uh, touched on that. I think repetition and practice in our daily lives, in our Christian lives, is so important. Um, it's, it's so much more than going to church and listening to the prayer and getting coffee during coffee hour and feeling motivated and excited. And then you drive home and everything gets forgotten and we go back to our daily habits and our daily ways, right? It's so much more than um, participating in this beautifully organized Reclaim conference, right? Um, and then what do we do as Christians when we log off, right? What do we do when this conference is over? All of this knowledge, which was shared to us, um, you know, if we don't take this with us, then none of this makes sense, right? Um, so I pray that me first and foremost um, and everybody else, um, I pray that God gives us the, the strength um, and the wisdom to take this information with us and apply it to our daily lives. And I think Janine also has a comment or a question, Janine. Oh, thank you. Yeah, just to, um, quickly, I hope there was time for this, but all of your presentations were so wonderful and you raised so many interesting things. And it, I just wanted to put this out there that um, we're, I'm in New York right now, so we're so able to be connected and this technology has been a boon for us in a lot of ways. I've attended more Bible studies over this past time than I than ever in my entire life, practically. There's something going on all the time. The churches are offering all kinds of things and all over everywhere we're, we're capable of connecting. I just hope we can keep using this technology in some way. And since you guys are the youth, <laughs> we'll just put that out there. I hope we'll figure out more ways to do it. Um, it's funny because if you look at um, pictures before the genocide from, from Turkey of the Armenian community, Armenians were so into using new technology. They had 
they were so into photography. We really used the technology. So this is a wonderful thing to continue here, I think. And thank you all so much. It was just great. But thank you for that. Thank you so much. Um, really, really do appreciate it. And we're glad that you could join and enjoy from uh, from New York, from the East Coast. And I, uh, that being said, I believe that Diran is back. Um, so we'll pass it off to Diran. Thank you, Deacon Diran. Thank you, Deacon Levon. Panel one participants, great uh, panel and very profound uh, thoughts. Uh, I really appreciate uh, all of your participation. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Diran Avakian, and uh, I'm the program director of the Western Diocese. Currently uh, coordinating also the Artsakh Outreach Humanitarian Program. Uh, allow me one second. I'm gonna share a video today with you. But before we start, I would like to introduce my co-panelists who joined today's conference from different parts of the country to explore together the different dimensions of faith in action, which is the topic of this panel. Uh, let me tell you that the format is gonna be a little bit different. So first I'm gonna introduce my panelists and then I'll make a short presentation, then we'll continue the conversation. We have with us uh, Andrew Garibian, a young acolyte who has passion for serving the church and God. Andrew, if you're here, hello, hi. Hi, hi Diran, thank you. We have hello. Dr. Mariam Garabedian. Hello, Mariam. Hello. Deacon Kevin Kestekian from the Bay Area is also part of the panel too. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Kevin. Deacon Ohan Kilisian. Kilislian. Yeah, Kilislian. Hello, everyone. Glad to be here. Hi, Deacon Ohan. Hello. Karin Yeni Komshian is with us, also from the Bay Area, I think from Cupertino. Karin, are you with us? Okay. We have then uh, Deacon Christopher Movsesian, our beloved Hello, hi everybody. son. Hi, Deacon Chris. And lastly, we have Deacon Avak Zakarian. Hello, everyone. Hi, Deacon Avak. Thank you guys for joining. So panel two is about exploring our faith in action. Uh, more specifically, we will be discussing our response to humanitarian crisis caused by the war in Artsakh. Recently, uh, I was thinking about the title of this panel, and the first thing that came to my mind was how we can explain this phrase to a non-believer, a person who has no faith in God. How can an abstract noun be so active, so potent, so capable and dynamic? How can faith be so alive? The Holy Scriptures, of course, offer many examples of active faith. I want to read a few quotes. You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. We read in the epistle of James, chapter 2, verse 22. St. Paul in his letter to Corinthians says, for we live by faith, not by sight. For we walk by faith and not by sight. Second Corinthians chapter five, verse seven. Faith that can move mountains as portrayed in the gospel of Matthew, chapter 17, verse 20. Faith that caused the walls of Jericho, you know, fall down. All these biblical examples can be discerned from the perspective of the principle of causation or casualty where faith is the cause and the effects are the actions that have been influenced by faith. Simply said from the perspective of cause and effect, where there is no effect without a cause and vice versa. To call something a cause is to imply that it has an effect. In his epistle, 
St. James described this most profound way. He says, what good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? In the next verse, he explicitly specifies what exactly he means by work or effect. He says, if a brother or sister has nothing to wear and has no food to, to eat, and you tell your brother, go in peace, keep warm and eat well, but you do nothing, what good is it? Then he concludes, so also faith of itself, if it doesn't have works, is dead. James chapter 2, verses 14 through 17. This is a very powerful statement, I think, ladies and gentlemen, addressed to all Christians, individually and collectively. Today, as the program director of the Western Diocese, I would like to share with you a glimpse of what we do in the motherland to help our displaced brothers and sisters from Artsakh as a result of this cruel war. I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to show you a short five minute uh, YouTube clip prepared by uh, Shoaka TV studio. It's in Armenian, but the subtitles are in English so you can guys follow. Մայրաթորում իր աշխատանքներն սկսել Արցախի աջակցության հանձնախումբը։ Հանձնախմբում ընդգրկված են ներկայացուցիչներ մեր եկեղեցու աշխարհասփյուր թեմերից։ Ամենայն հայոց հայրապետի նախաձեռնությամբ ստեղծված հանձնախմբի նպատակը Արցախից Հայաստան տեղահանվածների եւ նաեւ Արցախում ապրող մեր հայրենակիցների սոցիալական զանազան խնդիրների լուծումն է։ Առաջին փուլով բարենային սննդի ծրագիրն է իրականացվում։ Ահա այսպես մայրաթորի սոցիալական ծառայության գրասենյակի աշխատակիցները պատրաստում են մթերքի փաթեթները, որը շուրջ 30 անուն ապրանք է ներառում։ Կաթնամթերքով, մսամթերքով, նաև հիգիենայի պարագաներով այս փաթեթները նախատեսված են մեկ ամսվա համար։ Մայրաթորից փաթեթներն առաքվում են տարբեր թեմեր, որտեղից էլ քահանա հայրերը դրանք վաշխում են Արցախցի ընտանիքներին։ Բարենային սննդի հերթական ծրագիրն է կանում նպատակ ունենալով հետագային նաև բոլոր այս մարդկանցում, որ սննդի փաթեթներ են կասնում, նաև զարգացման աջակցության ծրագրեր կազմակերպել, այն պարզ տրամաբանությամբ, որ մարդկանց պետք է օգնել աշխատանք գտնելու հարցում, որովհետև հիմնավոր ուրեմն կյանքը կարող անան իրենք վարել, որովհետև մարդ եթե աշխատանք չունեցավ, ամեն ամենալավ օգնությունը նույնիսկ իրեն չի կարող պահել այդ հողում այդ ջրում։ Արմավիրի մարդ գյուղ լեռնագոգ վարձակալությամբ ապրող Արցախչի այս ընտանիքը զանգելանից է եկել։ Անին 3 զավակի մայրը փորձում է հարմարվել իր նոր բնակավայրին ու հանուն երեխաների առաջնայել։ Բարեկարգ մեծ ու հարմարավետ դպրոց ունի գյուղը, երեխաներից երկուսն արդեն նոր դպրոցում են սովորում։ Նատալին Տերհորն իր ընկերների դպրոցում ուսումնառության մասին է պատմում։ Որտա գիտես։ Տա Այնտեղ չգիտեմ, ինչն էր լավ, բայց լավ էր, ասում է տիկրան ու ներկայացնում իր բազմանդամ ընտանիքը, հարազատ քրոջն ու եղբորը, նաև հորեղբոր երեխաներին։ Գոհար Ստեփանյանի բազմանդամ ընտանիքը Ասկերանի շրջանի Ուխտասար գյուղում էր ապրում 18 տարի առաջ էին հաստատվել Արցախում։ Միտուն ստացել էին, մեկնել հասցել էին կառուցել, բայց ավագ վայել էլ չկարողացան։ Նորտան խոստումը մեկ տարուց շուտ չի լինի, մինչ այդ լեռնագոգցի ազգականի այս տանն են ապրելու։ Դիկին Գոհարը երկու հասների ու հինգ թորների հետ է ապրում։ Տղաները զինծարայողներ են, հաճախակի չեն կարողանում այցելել։ Համի մարդ մեմ ստեղի հողնուն տեղի հողը շատ տարբերություն կա, ունդեղ սևա հողը է, ստեղ նայում եմ մասում եմ կա վայեցի, որ այս պոստան միչը բանց հանեմ, տեսնես կծլ էի, կլնի, իսկ ընդեղ ինչ ծան էի, ինչ տներ հլնում էր։ Այսպես ամփորձանք ու խաղաղորեր մաղթելով կահանաներն այցելում էին արցախցի ընտանիքներ, բարենի պատետներից զատ փոխանցում նաև ամենայն հայոց կաթողիկոսի օրդնությունն ու սերը մայրաթորի լույսն ու ջերմությունը։ Տեր պարեն կահանա Արակելյանը զրուցում է Արցախչի այն ընտանիքների անդամների հետ, որոնց նախապես զանգահարել ու աշտարակի Սուրբ Մարյանն է եկեղեցի է հրավիրել, փոխանցելու մայրաթորի կողմից պատրաստված բարենի փաթեթները։ Իսկ աշտարակում վարձակալությամբ եւ կամ հարազատների տանն ապրող 30 Արցախչի ընտանիք է մնացել։ Հիմնականում այն մարդիկ են, ում բնակավայրերն անցել են ճշնամու իրավասության ներքո։ Գիտեք Արցախի ձեկած ընտանիքները հիմնականում գրեթե բոլորը բազմազավակ ընտանիքներ են։ 4 երեխայից պակաս ընտանիքներում չկան եւ այդ բազմազավակ ընտանիքներին պետք է ինչ որ ձևով խրախուսել եւ սա էլ առաջին հերթին 
ոչ թե նյութն է կարևոր, առաջին երթին կարևոր է ուշադրությունը։ Մարդիկ Արցախցիներ իրենք էլ են ասում, շնորհակալ են գրեթե բոլորը, որ հայրական ուշադրություն է իրենց։ Հիմա մենք ինչ պիտի տանք մարդկանց, առաջին հերթին պետք է փորձենք խաղաղություն տալ, հոգու խաղաղություն տալ, ինչ որ փորձում ենք անել։ Տեր հորեց զրույցի ընթացքում ամեն մեկ նիր տունն էր հիշում, իր հողն ու ջուրը, իր կարոտը, տիկին լուդան հադրութի թաղասեր գյուղից է, մի ամբողջ կյանքի այն տաղապրել ու մեկ վարկյանում թողել ամեն ինչ։ Այդ վիճակով մինչը վերջ չէի ուզում դուր զգավ։ Ես էի մեր ամբոշ թաղում ու մի հարևա մի հատքին։ Եդքին տել որ գնաց, մնացել եմ ես։ Ասեցի չէ, դեղ ոս հալ գնացել եմ ինչ մանակ։ Ես է Վեծ երեխաններով սենց թողլ ենք ու եկել ենք։ թե արցախում և թե Հայաստանում ապրող արցախահայրի ոգնության ծրագրերը շավնակական են լինելու ամենային հայոց հայրապետի նախաձրնությամբ ստեղծված աջակցենք արցախին հանձնախմբի անդամները վճրական են աշխարասպյուր թեմերի ոժանդակությամբ արցախահայությանը ամեն կերպ սատարելու կործում։ Մերի Հովսեփյան Հարություն Տոլանյան եկեղեցական կյանք։ Thank you Ter Vazgen I think Ter Vazgen was able to share the video although we didn't have the audio I hope you were able to uh, read the subtitles uh, thank you so much for bearing with me, with me that was some technical issues with YouTube couldn't load it uh, but again uh, the point is since beginning of the world the western diocese headed by our beloved primate his eminence archbishop Pavlan Derdegan has done a tremendous work to mobilize the resources of the Armenian community at large and deliver much needed help. I would like to use this opportunity to share some data with you. Uh, more specifically, I want to mention that the Western Diocese has transferred 1,193,669 dollars to Armenia fund during the first days of the war. Additionally, 1,911,857 dollars was raised and directly transferred to Armenia Fund by the churches of the Western Diocese. For this program, for the refugees, we raised and transferred additional $100,000 to the Mother Sea of Holy H. Miazin. After the war in November 2020, at the direction of the primate, and in collaboration with the DPSS of the Mother Sea, we launched this new humanitarian initiative aimed at supporting displaced families from Artsakh way before it became a global program. After signing the tripartite agreement on ceasefire on November 9, 2020, many displaced Artsakhsis who found refuge in Armenia during the days of the conflict have already returned to their homes in Stepanakert and other regions that were under the control of the Republic of Artsakh. However, those who lost their homes and have no place to return, they're still struggling to find temporary housing. The estimated number is 40,000 people. So the Department of the Social Services, working very closely with government and non-government agencies, assess the need of displaced families and help them through soup kitchens, also the Izmirilian Medical Center, temporary housing projects and other uh, you know, means, also giving uh, housing in the buildings that belong to the Mother Sea of Holy H. Miazin, like campgrounds, uh, the, the building for the clergy in H. Miazin, the camp in Tzachkazor, Sarmosavan, Yeregnazor, et cetera. Through the established protocols, the DPSS of Mother Sea of Holy H. Miazin evaluates and identifies the beneficiaries and then allocates the fund for housing, utilities like gas, electricity, because as you know, it's very cold in winter in Armenia and also for food. The list is very extensive. If you had a chance to look at it, it covers everything uh, from bread, eggs, milk, meat, 
you know, produce uh, dried uh, vegetables and fruits, uh, lentil, you know, beans and stuff uh, to basic hygiene supplies. Also through this program, we encourage young volunteer groups like psychologists, psychiatrists, family therapists, counselors to go for a special mission to Armenia and to render their professional services. I think it's our moral duty to ensure that our compatriots remain in Armenia and Artsakh, emerging stronger from the devastation of war and continue contributing to the prosperity of our country despite all odds. The current program is designed for three months. So after March, we're gonna evaluate and see uh, and most probably phase out to different development programs, uh, also giving the tools and means to these displayed families to become self-sufficient and uh, acquire new skills. The second phase of the program was uh, recently uh, completed, and I would say that 205 families consisting of 1,083 individuals have been benefited from the program. It is very well accepted and very much appreciated. Of course, we thank our community at large, our brothers and sisters who spare nothing to help the refugees or the displaced families. Now at this time, I would like to start the conversation with my co-panelists. I would like to continue this discussion of Christian call of duty uh, with Dr. Mariam Karapetian, who also wants to share how we can get closer to God. Mariam? Hi, can you guys hear me okay? Yes, okay, I see some nods. Okay, hi, I'm Mariam. I'm a family doctor. I'm just finishing my residency. I'm actually from British Columbia, Canada, so I'm an outlier. Thank you for inviting me to the conference. Um, so yeah, there are two things that I want to share in terms of what our reaction should be to the war and the humanitarian crisis in Artsakh and Armenia right now. The first is um, I think that we should actively be seeking ways to help, and the second is drawing closer to God, so I'll just touch on both of them. Um, in terms of actively seeking ways to help, um, I want to start off by sharing a verse that was just shared earlier. It's James 2, 14 to 17. So, what good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save them? If a brother or sister has nothing to wear and has no food for the day, and one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and eat well, but you do not give them the necessities of the body, what good is it? So also faith of itself, if it, if it does not have works, is dead. Um, so this passage describes Christian duty, and it applied pre-pandemic and pre-war, um, but it reads a little bit differently now. Um, and the reason why I say that um, is because we've witnessed the deep hatred that Azeris and Turks still hold against us. We've witnessed the suffering of our people, the civil unrest, and the near collapse of the healthcare system under the weight of the pandemic. This is just to name a few horrible events in 2020. Um, altogether, they're a testament, though, to the great need for aid in Armenia. They really show us how broken Armenia is in every aspect. So that means the state, the infrastructure, um, and the people, and the great urgency that there is to meet the spiritual needs, the physical, emotional, financial, and social needs. They also show us that the government is in no state to meet these needs. Um, the tragic state of our people though, so everything, like all of this together, is a great opportunity for each of us to show ourselves, um, our, our Christian neighbors, our brothers and sisters, our non-Christian brothers and sisters, and the Lord that our faith is alive. So each of us can reflect on how we can provide aid to Armenia and Artsakh. Um, and we need to really be creative about this. So whether that is through praying for specific families, flying over to volunteer our time and skills, serving in our local church fundraisers, sponsoring a specific family, whatever it can be, whether it's local or it's in Armenia, just be creative um, 
and live, like live your faith, show that it, it's alive. Um, so that's the first point. And then the second um, reaction that we should have in response to all of this is drawing closer to God. Um, the reason why I say that is because many of us have lost loved ones in the war. Um, but even if we have not personally grieved for a fallen soldier um, or a refugee family, we've all witnessed this astonishing and horrifying and tragic reality of the hatred that our neighbors harbor towards us. And we've witnessed how the world and the various humanitarian organizations turned a near blind eye to our suffering and the statement that makes about the value of an Armenian life. We've witnessed the civil unrest now destabilizing our country. Um, and all of this, like one of these things on their own is enough to drive someone crazy, but all of this together could drive us away from the Lord and towards hatred and vengeance and the desire for our enemies to suffer. In other words, um, it can drive us to become like our enemies, but we're called to love our enemies and to pray for them. We have been spit upon and tortured and abandoned and betrayed and ridiculed throughout all of this. But all of that Jesus experienced as well. And our experience, our shared experience, um, uh, it should be the same as what his reaction was. So like him, our reaction should be, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Um, and we need to ask God to help preserve our humanity um, and our identity by clothing us with the armor of God. Um, so kind of just to summarize, we should seek ways to actively seek ways to, to help out. And um, we need to draw closer to that because we're at such risk of seeking that vengeance and focusing on maybe building a mega army to get back our lands and to kill the Azeris and do to them what they did to us, you know, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. But that is a path that just leads to destruction of our country and our bodies and our souls. And it's not us, that is unfortunately them. So run from God, uh, run from all that and run to God. That's my advice. Um, he gives us the clarity of heart and mind to understand that peace is better than war. And he preserves who we are and he, he's the one who shapes and should shape our reaction to the conflict and the humanitarian crisis. So it should be around peace and love and all of that. Michael? Thank you, Marian. Thank you for this profound thoughts and also for emphasizing the loving kindness of God. Uh, Karin, uh, when we were preparing for this panel, you shared some uh, thoughts about love being the root of all kindness. And uh, you wanted to talk about not only faith in action, but also love in action. Please, the floor is yours. Oh, uh, I just wanted to say thank you, Deacon Diran and Mariam, you spoke wonderfully. Um, so I'm Karin Yeni Komshian. I'm from Cupertino and I sing in the choir at church um, at St. Andrews. And so out of the many teachings of Jesus, I wanted to focus today on his commandment, which is love one another the way that I have loved you. And so to understand this, we need to know what is love? And what does it require of us? So we can answer this by clarifying what the opposite of love is, which isn't hate, but apathy. So then love is caring and love is showing interest and paying attention. And so it's shown in what we do, and therefore love is action. So love one another the way that I have loved you. It's tricky though, because it's just so easy to be apathetic. So in the case of Artsakh, a thought that might naturally occur would be, you know, Artsakh is just so far away. There's nothing that I can do. Um, the problem is too big for me to fix on my own. Um, and in response to this, I, I would just, hope that we not settle for these kinds of thoughts and instead to try to help in whatever way you can, no matter if it's big or small. So the first part of this thought that Artsakh is so far away, um, a response could be that, I mean, distance doesn't really have much to do with it. People are still in need of help, whether they're your 
neighbor or whether they're across the other side of the world. And while it might seem easier to help if you're in Artsakh or in Armenia, you don't need to be there in order to help. You just might need to be a little bit more creative in the way that you approach it. Um, there are so many simple things that you can do. And if all, I mean, if all else fails, you can pray for an idea, just a quick prayer. Please God help me think of a way that I can aid the situation. And then the second part of that thought that the problem is so big, it's too big for one person to take upon themselves. Well, if a problem is too big to solve completely, you can focus on just one aspect of it. And some different aspects in Artsakh that still need our attention um, and still need to be addressed are the relocated families and injured soldiers and also engagement in advocacy. And these issues are really broad and vague on them in themselves. But again, there are a lot of small things that we can do to help. So for example, with the relocated families, the refugees, like we had seen in the video, um, and the injured soldiers, there are a few things we can do, like donate. Um, it's an act of self selflessness. And um, you can also fundraise. You can organize something with your church community. Um, for example, so Lori was in the first panel. Um, she's my sister, and we had published a children's book together, and all of the proceeds for that go to aid Artsakh. And it's a small thing, but again, if everyone does something small, it can really make a huge impact. Um, another thing you can do for these families and for the soldiers is to send them letters to give them encouragement and hope. Um, you can give the government. Um, so I would federal government to inform them on the situation if you haven't done so already. Because I mean, Azerbaijan still has, they haven't released over 200 hostages, civilians and prisoners of war. So um, you need to also fight against this misinformation campaign that has been kind of stressful along this entire past half a year. Um, and then stay informed about issues being put to vote. Um, so just try to keep up with everything. <laughs> Um, so these are just a handful of general ideas about how to be engaged and take action um, to help after the repercussions of the war in Artsakh. But we should also show love through our deeds in our broader life too. Um, Dr. Hirach had said, Christianity is a living faith. So we need to live it. And the New Testament is filled with Jesus's teachings, which tell of his actions. He heals the sick, he feeds the hungry, he dines with the sinners, and most importantly, he sacrifices himself to save our souls. And of course, we can't perform miracles like he can, but we can still behave like him. And he showed love and paid attention to those in society who have been overlooked and neglected. He was selfless and he didn't make excuses. When he faced the devil, I mean, he, he didn't say, no, no, I'm going to do that next week. He didn't put it off. And we need to follow that example. Jesus said, love one another the way that I have loved you. And this means that like him, we also need to give help and take care of those who need it. If we find ourselves making excuses, which is only natural, we need to pause and think about how valid those excuses are. And then we need to shift our mindset to one of love instead of apathy in order to address them. And I say this as if it's a simple thing when in reality it's not. It takes concentration and persistent effort to change your mindset. And it may take many failed attempts, but it's also, incredible it's also incredibly natural to want to care and to want to help. And so love requires that you do. And we may understand love as a feeling, but in truth, it's just faith put into action. So thank you, everyone. Beautifully said, Karin, beautifully said. And uh, you talked about apathy. You know, Mother Teresa, who was a few years ago canonized by the Roman Catholic Church, has very strong words about the, uh, you know, the apathy of the West. Uh, in her words, she says, the greatest disease in the West today is not the TB or leprosy. It's being unwanted, unloved, 
and uncared for. We can cure physical diseases with medicine, but the only cure for loneliness, despair, and hopelessness is love, just like you mentioned. There are many in the world who are dying for a piece of bread, but there are many dying for a little love. The poverty in the West is a different kind of poverty. It's not only poverty for loneliness, but also of spirituality. There is a hunger for love as there is a hunger for God. I think she beautifully uh, summarizes this and uh, this is exactly what you were talking about. Thank you, Karen. Thank you for sharing. You know, Jesus was the ultimate example of service, serving the people, serving the poor, serving the uh, disadvantaged people and uh, his disciples served too. Uh, Deacon Chris, I want to invite you to elaborate a little bit about the role of the church and more specifically the, the role of the deacons in humanitarian initiatives. Hi, Didon. Hi, everybody. My name is Chris Movsesyan. I'm uh, 25 years old from Pasadena, California. I currently serve as a deacon in the Armenian Church. I am a lifetime churchgoer and I am a part of the Deacons Council. I work as a project manager for a mechanical engineering construction firm. Um, first off, I want to start by saying thank you to Sir Pazan, Dervaskin, and all the participants for this opportunity to come together. After the year we all went through, it's important to sit down and reflect on everything that's happened and allow us to reclaim ourselves, our identity, and our faith. Um, I've put together just some thoughts based on the video that was shared by Didon and some of the thoughts that I've had over the past year. Um, the first one is, as a deacon of the Armenian church, it's inspiring to see what the church is doing in the relief effort in Artsakh. As the video showed, these relief efforts were spearheaded by His Holiness Kada King II and involved numerous priests, deacons, and volunteers. There is no question, it is our responsibility as Christians and Armenians to be there helping the displaced, the homeless, the soldiers, the hungry firsthand, and this is an awesome example of faith in action. It also showed that we are, that we were very reactive by necessity, you know, but in turn, it also means that we need to be a little more proactive as to prepare for the future. Um, it is our duty to help build up the Armenian people, the economy, the infrastructure, the housing, and most importantly, our faith and church. That is one of our main duties as a deacon. Um, the war and the continued aftermath has been difficult for all of us, but it was also a wake up call. And, you know, it really made us realize how precious our shared culture is, our faith, our church, and how important it is for us to support and fortify it and how easily it can, it can be taken away from us. You know, one of the things we saw during the war was how churches in Artsakh became these strongholds and these embodiments of our culture and faith. Dadivank, we had uh, Derovanes staying in the church. He was performing services, weddings, Badarak, until the very end. He was sleeping there every night. You know, we saw archaeologists coming from all over the world to come preserve these pieces of that church. You know, there's a reason that there's an importance and there's this unity and this tie to these churches and our faith. In Sepanakert, we, we saw Barkev Serpazan calling for justice on the stairs. And we saw artists uh, coming to create music in the cathedrals. You know, this gave a spark to many young people from the diaspora. You know, thankfully, we had social media where we were able to see, you know, have outreach and see and have participate in the relief effort, you know, during these times. And, you know, they were a lot of these people in the diaspora, they're just discovering their culture and their faith. And so, you know, you know, that's the, the silver lining of all this, you know. And it made our people realize that we can't take our faith or church for granted. Um, the second point is just, you know, just a thought I had. Um, as an engineer and as an Armenian, I can't not think of our situation in terms of chess. The Armenian church is our queen. She's omnidirectional and arguably the most powerful piece we have. And it's one of our duties that we must defend and support it. Unfortunately, it is also a piece that most of us have not been using the full potential of. Uh, in order for us to do this, it's gonna take, you know, it takes a lot of money, even though it's, it's important, it's gonna take more than money. It's gonna require action and faith and 
everything that we saw in the videos that's being done with by Sopas on Diran and um, the Catholicos. Um, and it's also going to take faith that God will guide us and that we will, you know, he'll take us together, that we'll keep our identity, our culture relevant and alive for future generations. This is the never ending struggle of a Christian, especially as Armenian Christians. Luckily, we have gatherings like this, uh, like Reclaim, where we're able to come together and brainstorm and develop our future. So really, thank you, everybody. Um, I want to conclude by thanking Didon, our moderator, and all of our volunteers and soldiers for their firsthand efforts in the relief programs in Artsakh and being that example of faith in action. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Uh, your approach about the Armenian church being the stronghold or even the safe haven for the Armenian people is really uh, very powerful. And I remember uh, the patriarch of Jerusalem, Kurev Israelian, who during the Arab-Israeli war in 1947, he called all the Armenians in Jerusalem to the Armenian monastery, and he locked all the gates in order to protect the people and for six months in the church, in the monastery, he helped, supported, and fed 5,000 people in the church. And uh, I just remembered this story because, again, our churches are, you know, our uh, strongholds, our uh, safe havens where we can find peace and consolation. Thank you again for sharing this idea. We have uh, many deacons in this panel, and uh, we have uh, Deacon Kevin, Deacon Ohan, Deacon Chris, Deacon Awak, and Andrew is an acolyte, uh, deacon to be. Uh, Andrew, if you want to talk about the specific role of the deacons, we also remembered we, we shared about uh, the seven deacons in the book of Acts, how they were chosen by the apostles to serve the tables to, to help uh the, the the widows and people who were neglected by others i think they can have a specific role and uh, you can elaborate on this andrew yeah th thank you diran so in the book of acts chapter six uh it talks about how the disciples needed uh deacons to serve the table while the disciples went to preach the word of god and to spread the word of god so i think after this war in Artsakh, it kind of showed us that we need to turn deacons to our, to our motherland and to our people. And the war obviously caused a humanitarian crisis and we need to focus on rebuilding and doing humanitarian work over there because like obviously we pray for like things to get better, but I feel like we also need to push for sending direct help there say like food clothes medicine first aid all of that stuff and i at my church we there were a lot of people coming to do that during the war like during the fall they would pack food medicine first aid to send over there and i think that's what our christian duty should be we shouldn't stop doing that we should keep doing that because also in matthew 20 chapter 25 it says when you feed others you also feed christ so basically what it means when you satisfy others you're also satisfying christ so i think we need to reflect on that as well because our people more than ever need help like now so I think there's no time to wait. And like, as I was saying, it's our Christian duty. We should be helping our people like like it should be our duty to help them. Like it's our people. We can't turn our eye against our own people. And a lot of people had to flee Artsakh to most of them just went to Armenia to escape the war. And because of the war, like we, we need to make an effort to move these people either back to their homes in Artsakh or obviously not all of them will be able to do that. 
So like if they want to stay in Armenia, we should at least help them settle down over there. And I think we need to make like a like hands-on thing, like hands-on rebuilding. And the perfect thing I know about is SEMA. Our diocese has a program called SEMA. It's Christian Youth Mission to Armenia. And they go every summer uh, from June to July. And obviously last year they didn't go because of COVID, but this year they're planning on going in June. And it's more like hands-on, like rebuilding, reconstruction. Like it's basically a pilgrimage you go for about a month, month and a half to Armenia. And it's, there's a lot of projects that they do over there, like building, building houses, they paint houses, they paint schools, and they get students to, they put students into these schools. And they also go shopping with families to get clothes, to get food in Armenia, this is all in Armenia. And I think this is a really, like we should focus on this because it's hands on, because obviously in America you can do like so much, but when you're actually in Armenia, it's different. And going there and helping, it's, it's like the people really appreciate it. You're helping all the refugees to move into homes reconstruct homes build homes and i think i think sema is a really good thing to focus on and they go every every summer so they're going in june to july of this year and if anyone wants to know more information about it you can uh contact me or i think kev kev deacon kevin who's on this panel too he would he went a couple of years ago as well so you can talk to him as well i know about it so if you want to just chat with me you can you can ask me any questions i'll i'll be able to answer thank you thank you andrew thank you very impressive and thank you for connecting now to the next topic uh, which is going to be presented by deacon kevin kestekian who is an engineer by profession and also a deacon as i mentioned uh, yesterday, I think it was past 10 o'clock when I received an extensive email from Kevin. He did a tremendous job. He, I mean, I'm really impressed by the depth of, of, uh, of the theological thought that he delivered uh, in approaching a holistic, uh, holistic way of healing. Uh, as a deacon, uh, that's his vocation, that's his calling, and as a uh, very promising engineer. Uh, Kevin, please share your ideas. Thank you, Dion. Thank you for your uh, very kind introduction and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kevin Kestekian. I serve as a deacon at St. John Armenian Church in San Francisco. I also currently serve as a member of the Deacons Council, as well as a member of the Armenian Church Youth Organization Central Council of the Western Diocese. As Dion mentioned, I work as a civil engineer for a local general contractor in the San Francisco Bay Area. It is a pleasure to have the opportunity today to speak on this topic with Diron and fellow panelists. The aspect of the discussion I would like to speak about is healing and progress. As we reflect upon the last several months and work as a diaspora to address the current crucial needs of our refugees, it is important that we do not lose sight of both our short-term goals and our long-term goals for our beloved Armenia. A quote that I found to be crucial to the mindset in dealing with this tragedy came from the video. In speaking about the families of Artsakh, Deir Arakelian said, they need attention and moral support, which is more important than the material one. The people of Artsakh appreciate very much the pastoral attention they are receiving. Now, what should we give to people? First and foremost, we are trying to give them peace, peace to their souls. Emotionally, these circumstances are difficult to cope with because as Armenians, we have fought for decades and in fact centuries to make progress as a people. We have made many strides and taken positive steps forward through our perseverance and through the support coming from the diaspora. Every person has an inherent longing to help and support causes they are passionate about. I would say this is even more crucial and personal due to where we have all come from. I know that today we have audience with us in our audience, individuals, 
from different parts of the diaspora. But one thing we're all a part of is the effort to support our nation in yet another dark time in its history. It is important to heal properly and to honor our martyrs and their families who are still with us. These refugees need to be the focal point of our rebuild in Artsakh. It is also crucial to continue building in Armenia and encouraging more expansion. Sarah Mangasaryan in the video said, we are aiming to implement development and support programs, keeping in mind that people need help to find jobs so that they can have a decent life. Because if a person does not have a job, even the best help cannot keep him on his land. We as a people cannot afford to wait. It is inherent on us as a diaspora to encourage and indeed to lead the charge for progress in Armenia. The two ways to have this growth and progress are internally through Armenia, as well as through businesses emanating from other countries and regions of the world, creating jobs in Armenia. This will be achieved through stability first, from rebuilding our military and strengthening our position in the region. Infrastructure projects, including roads, hospitals, and electricity networks, with Dion referenced earlier, will be the first step in rebuilding and establishing the foundation for further development. Construction both of residential and commercial structures will help alleviate some of the issues facing Armenia today. Residential construction is necessary to prop up communities. In the short term, this will be important for relocation of those who have been displaced due to the war. In the long term, the development of other communities outside of Yerevan will be crucial to the progress of the economy and to bringing prosperity to the Armenian people. Last year, Armenia was ranked 127th in the world for GDP, which is 104th in the world per capita. New urban planning needs to be a focus of our enterprising nation. Commercial projects like office buildings, malls, schools, and cultural centers will give more opportunities to the youth and provide these jobs. This is especially important in addressing the increasingly crucial issue of the emigration of young people from Armenia. When I was last in Armenia in 2018 through SEMA, the Christian Youth Mission to Armenia, which Andrew just happened to mention, we were able to assist with projects he mentioned, including aiding families and schools. Personally, I also had the opportunity to be an intern at a general contractor in Armenia and see the types of projects they were working on. Many of the projects involved small residential ground up or renovation projects. At the time, there were several projects that were under construction by this firm as well as by others. Obviously, large scale projects and mass community development cannot happen overnight. What we can do is support entrepreneurship in Armenia. Projects supporting businesses in Armenia or working to have other companies around the diaspora open offices in Armenia is how we can ensure that we are always moving forward toward establishing a strong position in the region. While we have all supported monetarily as able, putting our faith in action ultimately entails visiting Armenia and supporting organizations providing aid to Armenians. Also working to better the current infrastructure of Armenia in Yerevan and its surrounding regions. As Mariam mentioned, it is our Christian duty to provide aid to our brothers and sisters in Armenia. Our support will accelerate the recovery from war and poverty while propelling Armenia towards a prosperous future. Through better education for the next generation and growing through construction and the economy, we can move from a developing and emerging country to a leader in a volatile region of the world. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin, and thank you for emphasizing on the pastoral care and counseling. You know, this is a very important aspect. I mean, we can give everything to these people, everything, material, food, housing, clothing, but it's very important that we help that the, this, uh, these families to heal and uh, to overcome the bereavement, the loss. Uh, and uh, as Mother Teresa was saying, it's not only, I mean, people are not hungry for food only, but also for the word of God. And uh, I also want to tell you a story about when she goes to a mission trip to Mexico and she says, we met some families with literally nothing, nothing to eat, nothing to wear. They were really, really poor, but these people are begging, mother, teach us the word of God. We don't want anything else. We don't want food. We don't, we don't want any clothing. Just teach us the word of God. Uh, so that part, that aspect is equally important. And thank you for um, talking about it. Thank you again, uh, Kevin.
Deacon Ohan, are you with us? Yes, I am. Thank you, thank you for joining. Uh, I invite you to, to share your thoughts about uh, faith in action or loving action as uh, Karen. Yeah. Uh, thank you everyone for uh, tuning in and joining from you know, all parts of the world. Thank you to Pazan Hyde and Dead Voskin for putting this uh, lovely event together and for all the moderators and panelists as well. Uh, so like I said, I'm Deacon Oang Kilisin. I serve at St. Peter Van Nuys in Los Angeles. Been serving here since 2015 after graduating from St. Peter's uh, Sunday School. Uh, currently, I'm working as a project manager at a real estate development company, and I'm also a member of the Deacons Council, like uh, many of my brothers here. So if anything can be learned from the events that took place in 2020, <clears throat> excuse me, is that the Armenian community and the church are the only things that are keeping Armenia afloat. The many pleas for help and the calls for action for the rest of the world to help us and intervene all fell on deaf ears, while the acts that were taking place were eerily similar to those in the genocide in 1915. With the amount of negativity that is going on in Armenia currently, like some of the panelists mentioned, the priority has to be to strengthen the church and its ties to the people. There are many pillars that make up our Armenian culture, whether that be Christianity or language in our land. The losses that we sustained due to the war are immensely difficult for us to process. The loss of so many lives, churches, and our sacred land could not could lead to generational issues regarding to our people's history, identity, sense of connection, and belonging. And it's very easy for that new void to be filled with hopelessness and despair. Watching our brothers and sisters get displaced and abandon their lives and leave everything behind leads little to the imagination of what took place during the genocide with our great grandparents and ancestors. So the church is what is, what is keeping our hope alive. It's one of the only aspects of Armenian society that people can truly rely on. It's inspiring to see these videos and broadcasts of how in these unbelievably dire situations, the church is doing an amazing job at aiding communities, supporting the church, whether that be through donations or volunteering time, gives the opportunity for the church to keep sending aid to those in need. It gives the opportunity to keep sending priests and deacons to speak with, pray, and overall maintain the faith that helps people through these hard times and keep our culture alive. Whatever amount of help someone can give, is what keeps the ball rolling as the church uh, is key to not only helping with the physical challenges, but the spiritual ones as well. These conflicting times are the perfect opportunity to band together and show our strength and faith in the church. We're very determined and faithful people and that determination and continued faith in the church and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will keep us moving forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Deacon Ohan. Thank you for sharing your thoughts. Uh, and I think it's very important for our people to understand the urgency of the matter, you know. Um, yes. Some discussions in the community, people say, oh, this organization is more trustworthy. This organization is more uh, a credible organization, this and that. Uh, but it's important to realize that someone out there is starving as we discuss the credibility or trustworthiness of this or that organization. Uh, so the, the need, uh, need for help is very urgent. Uh, again, as Mother Teresa says, yesterday is gone. Tomorrow has not yet come. We have only today. Let us begin. Let us begin today. And uh, I was very much touched about a story that I read, again, uh, about Mother Teresa when a young woman with a child in her hand comes and knocks on her door and begs for food. She says, mother, I was in this neighborhood and I was knocking on the doors and people were criticizing me. They're saying, you know, you're young, you're capable. Why are you begging, you know, go and work, uh, go earn your bread. And uh, mother Teresa says, you know, I knew those eyes. I have seen hungry eyes before. I knew what she wanted. And I turned to, to bring some you know, rice for the kid. And by the time I fetched the food, the child in her hand was dead. It's that urgent, you know. It's, it's a, it might be a matter of one minute, two minutes. It's that urgent. That's what Mother Teresa wants to uh, convey to us. Thank you again, uh, Deacon Owen. And I want to invite now uh, Deacon Avak Zakarian from a Holy Apostles Church, um, Santa uh, uh, Tahanga. Uh, to share his thought. Uh, he wants to emphasize about, uh, you know, enabling these people. 
not only giving the food, as they said, not giving the fish, but also the fishing rod. Uh, he wants also to speak about sustainability and responsible farming. So Deacon Avag, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, Diran, uh, for the introduction. Uh, so as he said, my name is Avag Zakarian. Uh, I'm a deacon at the Holy Apostles Armenian Church in Southern California, and I'm also a member of the Deacons Council. So um, I'm also a student of veterinary medicine. So I wanted to relate uh, what we're talking about briefly to my field of expertise and uh, emphasize a few other points. So um, earlier we talked about the uh, Christian call of duty and uh, the quote from the book of James where it emphasizes uh, faith and action. And so what I wanted to emphasize about is specifically how our donations to the church will help the people of Armenia and the Armenians of Artsakh. Um, and the video explained it fairly well, and uh, Diran explained it well earlier as well. Um, but I wanted to um, specifically talk about how our monetary donations will actually help with the feeding of the displaced Arme uh, people of Artsakh and Armenia in general. And so the question becomes, uh, where will this food come from? How are we going to feed our people? And um, in the video, um, if you saw uh, or if you're reading the text, there was a lady by the name of Mrs. Gohar, and uh, she was explaining that in Artsakh, uh, she could plant anything she wanted in her soil and it'll grow. But she said here, like referring to Armenia, the soil looks like clay and she was wondering if, if she plants something, will it grow or not? So what I wanted to say is we need to help uh, uh, the families in Armenia and Artsakh not to um, only like to feed them, but we also need to find them housing. And, and by finding them housing, we want them to be able to have jobs to uh, be uh, able to keep their houses uh, standing so that they can feed their families as well. And um, a lot of the feed that uh, we look for uh, are coming from like plants that we grow on our land. Uh, but it also comes um, from the animals that we have on our land. Uh, we need to have animals, animals like cows, sheep, uh, goats, uh, and more, because these will provide things like meat to eat or milk to drink or wool for like clothing. And, um, and not only that, but we also have to think about all the animals that uh, were displaced from Artsakh and the animals that were lost from the Armenian families that owned, for example, farm animals or animals that were like pets. Um, and animals are important for us. And the reason for that is because, uh, especially now, because it provides a lot of emotional support for us, especially with being in a pandemic right now, and especially after uh, the war and the tragedy that we went through. And um, another thing that I wanted to emphasize is, I wanted to ask all of us to just pray. We need to pray constantly and every day for our fallen soldiers. We need to pray for our families of these soldiers. We need to pray for each other and we need to pray for our beloved Armenia. And most importantly, we should stay united. And that is the most important thing that we have to do. So that way we can all thrive and continue to be resilient. So that way we can show the world who Armenians are and how brave we are. And let us be the image of Christianity. Thank you. Thank you, Deacon Alak. That was a very interesting perspective, you know, uh, farm animals and pets as a source of uh, comfort and also a livelihood, you know, uh, as you said, a cow can uh, feed a family. Uh, also, it, it's, it's very uh, interesting. Uh, remember the story when Jesus was feeding the multitude? You know, before he taught people, he fed people. He saw hunger on their face and he fed the people. And then he started, you know, teaching. Um, and I think we have a lot of work to do. We have to feed people. We have to educate people. We have to enable people. We have to uh, offer development program for them to acquire new skills and uh, to adjust their lives and cope with grief uh, and uh, bereavement. Uh, offer psychological, pastoral, counseling, and care. This is very, very important. And uh, that's what our people expect. That's what our Christian duty is. 
because more than ever, people want to see love in action through humble works. And uh, it, it's, it's very necessary, I think. It's very important because uh, eventually uh, it's all about love, love in action, faith in action. And love to be true has to hurt. Again, I want to tell you another story from Mother Teresa about this uh, family who was starving for days and she takes some rice to the family and later finds out that this family who was starving for days gave the food to another family, a neighbor who appeared to be a Muslim family, also, you know, starving from hunger. I mean, this is the ultimate example of, uh, you know, love, the true love that also hurts, you know. Imagine Indian family giving, starving family giving her food to another family, a Muslim family who's starving too. Uh, this is a very beautiful and profound example because love is for today. Programs are for the future. We are for today. When tomorrow will come, we shall see what we can do. But somebody is thirsty today. Somebody is hungry for food today. Tomorrow, we will lose these people. So let's be concerned with what we do today. I think that's the main message of the day. And I want to invite the audience now to, to ask any questions they want, and also the panelists, if they want to engage in, uh, in a conversation, you're welcome. You can uh, start a conversation or answer questions from the floor. <clears throat> Let me go ahead and interject if I may, Diran. First of all, thank you so much for moderating this discussion and thank you to all of our wonderful panelists with so much insight. I mean, a wealth of insight, so much um, to share. And, and, and that information is valuable. And it's something that I'm going to speak personally on my behalf. It's something I'll be pondering upon, something I'll be writing about and reflecting about um, as I uh, consider how it is that uh, as a Christian, I can take action, further action to help our uh, beloved uh, brothers and sisters in Christ uh, in Artsakh or those who have been displaced as a result of the war. But I want to go ahead and turn it over to some of these questions. Uh, and, you know, I'm just kind of go ahead and uh, start off with the first uh, one that I'm seeing here that I was able to monitor out during the conversation, during the discussion. And that's what I see from Tade uh, Matosian. Um, Tade asks, how can we encourage and incentivize Armenian entrepreneurship by leading with God first in our time of need and burdened by greed? Does anybody on the panel have a way of addressing this question? It's a great question, by the way. Thank you, Tade. Anyone um, wants to answer from the panel? Yeah, I can jump in. Um, I think that uh, if you're incentivizing Christian Armenians, it's a lot easier than someone, you know, who might not be as close to, to their faith because um, God is really the motivation to unify and he's the one who's going to protect our hearts and our minds from being self-seeking and from becoming just overwhelmed with these stories of betrayal um, which can just drive someone to abandon the nation um, and just give up, right? So he's shaping our goals. So um, I guess you'd have to really engage people one-on-one -on -one in those kind of conversations so that they understand like how do we how do we avoid um, allowing that greed and betrayal and all that stuff to to blind us and then like how do we like open up you know some people use that example of faith is the, like it's the sun the glasses I put on and that's how I view the world so like how do we how do we help them to do that um, and maintain that humanity piece that's my perspective. Definitely valuable thoughts there, Mariam. Thanks for sharing. Um, yeah, there, there's definitely, I think, um, you know, if I may chime in on this, it, it's tougher to have these conversations uh, with people who possibly don't share that same, uh, you know, Christian background or Christian upbringing or Christian influence, Christian atmosphere. 
But at the end of the day, um, something that I was able to reflect on a couple of years back when uh, I had a chance to spend some time with the youth at the Armenian Church summer camp uh, back in 2018. And it's what everybody just spoke about, right? We we're talking about the language that everybody speaks, and it's a universal language, and that language is love. And it is the language that transcends all cultures, all patterns, mannerisms, books, you know, history, it transcends all of it. And the reason being is not because of the fact that love is this, you know, word that we use when we feel mushy gushy on the inside. But it's a verb, right? It's, it's a living testament of truth. It is interchangeably the word that is also known as God. God is love and love is God. And I think that if somebody doesn't necessarily share that same uh, faith or upbringing, it is by our actions, right? I'm uh, mirroring what Diran was also mentioning in all of the actions that Mother Teresa was responsible for in her life. If we act with love, if we act with truth, if we act with justice, this is a great way that we can, you know, even introduce the idea of God and incentivize uh, Armenian creation. We're created in God's image to create as well, right? To create new ideas, to be entrepreneurs, to be innovators. And I think that that definitely exists in this panel alone today with all of these incredible innovative uh, ideas. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you for sharing that, Mariam. Just to touch on like the encouragement part of it, you know, our Western Diocese has a great program. It was already mentioned, SEMA. You know, that's a great tool that we have where young people can go to Armenia and it's led by a priest. It's led by deacons, you know, and they, they see all the sites and they see the churches and they get that component of it. But they also get to intern with, you know, actual corporations and actual businesses in Armenia. And, you know, that I think that's like a great step for incentivizing and encouraging kids at a young age to say hey this is your country this is your homeland you are going to be growing up and you need to you know help it however you can absolutely yeah absolutely SEMA is absolutely a great program I'm seeing it in the chat here Carmen mentioned uh that it is an awesome program um let's kind of bubble up a little bit to another one of the comments um, that I was able to filter out over here. And it is a comment from Janine. And it's Janine's concern about the many Armenians who don't know their church, and for that matter, haven't been baptized. Uh, there are also many Christian, uh, quote, poachers of other denominations. Uh, she writes that she doesn't think resilience is really possible in a devastating loss without our faith so for her it's important uh, it is an important issue to re-evangelize our own people in Hayastan and as Diran said it is our mother church that is the place of love for the people what are your thoughts on this comment panel ists <laughs> I think Dick and Kevin reflected on this, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's part of the pastoral care and counseling, not only uh, to comfort the people, but also uh, bring them closer to the church, to re uh, acquaint them with the teachings of the church. Uh, because for some reasons, you know, in Armenia, church was a distant, uh, uh, you know, presence, institution. And now during these days of... Uh, calamity, I think uh, it has become truly and really uh, a safe place for, uh, for our people, for our faithful people uh, to, to live there and to reevaluate the teachings of the church and uh, to be closer to God and to the church. Uh, Deacon Kevin, if you want to speak about this. Absolutely. I think um, and actually, you mentioned it as well at the onset um, of this discussion, uh, Diran. I think it's something that we need to focus on 
absolutely, because we have many concerns that were uh, discussed here. I know um, from raising uh, produce and making sure that those refugees get housing, there's a number of concerns that need to be addressed. But as a number of the panelists said here and in previous panels, faith needs to be there first. We need to build ourselves through the Christian nation. We need to identify ourselves through our Christianity and through our Armenian apostolic faith. That needs to come first because, again, our enemies, they may try to break our resolve, but as long as we have that unity, it cannot be broken. So I think that that is the na number one aspect that needs to be established. And I'm hopeful that it has been established, but I think oftentimes um, we may question whether it's there because of the various difficulties that we see um, in Armenia and perpetrated by our enemies. So um, I think, again, like you said, Dion, it's really making sure that faith is first. Um, putting that faith in action um, is how we're able to ultimately unify and move forward with all of our um, hopes and aspirations for our motherland. Wonderful, wonderfully said. Deacon Levon, do we have any other questions? We do, we do. Thank you, Diran. Thank you, Kevin, uh, for sharing that. Um, what, what will we do differently? This is a question from Ted Iskenderian. And he asks, what will we do differently now to get the word of God to these hungry people if this fundamental task was not ad adequately done in peace time, during a time of peace? That's a really, really good question. Uh, who, who, who wants to tackle that? Is Surpaz on there? Maybe he has an answer to that one. That's a great question. Well, the answer is very simple. At all times, evangelism should take place. You cannot, uh, you know, uh, look for the right time. The right time is every second. Uh, and I think we should all understand that, you know, evangelism is infused in our uh, blood, the blood of the history, blood of our nation and the people. Uh, however, after the pandemic and after the Artsakh war, evangelism has to be thousandfold uh, because that will be uh, the, the sole ground for us to stay strong uh, and distinct uh, as the nation which has accepted Christianity as the state uh, religion 1700 years ago. And um, what I see that Christianity being the way for us uh, ha has to be applied in our daily life. And the reality is, yes, in as much as we consider ourselves, we are Christians, uh, we need to become, like one of you has said it, we need to become the image of Christianity. The reality is that we have failed in our faith life. And we have to say this very sincerely. And what I hear from the youth here, I'm really, really proud because I see that, you know, um, the present youth uh, have uh, a deeper understanding of the Christian faith. Uh, it's not philosophy for our youth, Christianity. Christianity is, is a way of life. And the discussions which have taken place, uh, you know, gives me hope uh, and inspiration that our youth have taken uh, the Christian faith very seriously. So definitely in, in today's times, uh, when we are still going through the pandemic, um, uh, this is the time also to refocus, you know, uh, our attention and prayer life um, on evangelism. Uh, and evangelism has been part of uh, the life of our ancestors, uh, somehow it, it was disrupted for the past 105 years, starting genocide, maybe even before genocide. Uh, but God is um, interjecting into the life of uh, Armenia and Armenians around the world. And somehow we feel that we're given that chance again uh, to continue our um, 
mission as a church, as a nation. Uh, so let's take this mission very seriously. Uh, and in a disciplined manner, I should say, and we will definitely uh, be, will continue our our life as as the Armenian nation. Yesterday, uh, Father Vaskem Boyajan was with me, and uh, I shared with him an interesting thought. This has to do, maybe not directly, but indirectly, with with Armenia. I am not really concerned with the size of Armenia. Even if we had like, uh, you know, a small country, you know, uh, like today's Armenia, that would be sufficient for me uh, to look at uh, the present Armenia, to be inspired with, with Armenia, because uh, it's not in the size of Armenia that um, we are strengthened, we are inspired, we are empowered, uh, it's the spirit of Armenia which keeps the entire diaspora, even though the two thirds of Armenians are living outside of Armenia, that a tiny uh, land of our ancestors will still give us uh, the strength. So uh, the faith has to live in our motherland, has to be uh, preached, you know, the word of God has to be uh, there in the hearts and souls of our brothers and sisters, and there cannot be any other way for us um, to move on to the next generation and the coming generation. So this is my, my perception. This is my credo. This is what I believe in, and I know that you all believe it, uh, in the same. Uh, but when we work together, when we pray together, uh, when we collaborate, uh, uh, when we continue this journey together, then there, there will be no a weakening point, I should say. Uh, there's so much that we can say, but I think this should be enough at this point. Thank you for sharing I hope, that. Uh, I hope, Mariam, I responded to uh, your question, I mean, your request. Well, yeah, I invited you to respond, and it was much better than uh, what I could have said. Yeah. By the way, I have known Mariam, Dr. Mariam Garabedian, since her birth. Uh, and uh, she's been an intelligent little girl. And uh, for us all to hear that she's a doctor, oh, my goodness. That is the best reward that I can get as a priest of the Armenian Church. Abris, Mariam. Thank you. Deacon Levon, if I may add uh, a few words on this, I think during these difficult times, uh, it is the time that uh, we revive the apostolic mission of the church. And uh, we should do this by living example. Uh, it, it is very important, you know, that we practice what, what we preach. And uh, uh, this makes a tremendous, uh, you know, effect on our people, they see it, they sense it, they can feel when we are real. Uh, and I just wanna give you an example, you know, when this uh, war started and uh, the diocese uh, appealed uh, the congregation, the faithful uh, to support the humanitarian initiatives, I'm very proud to say, and I'm sorry, Sir Pazan, that I have to say this in front of you in your presence, but our diocesan primate and the clergy of the Western Diocese, they made a personal pledge of $100,000 to help our displaced families. And uh, I think personally that uh, this personal pledge, this personal example, this living example made a huge impact on the overall fundraising effort. And in everything we do, uh, it has to be a living example. We have to justify our faith with our works, as St. James says. Very well said, seriously. Um, I, I think that that's, that's such a great point that, you know, our, our faith can't be a faith that remains on our lips, but rather it's a faith that hears our lips and works with our hands, right? Um, so very, very well said, Diran, and I appreciate 
your point. And uh, I'm sure I speak on behalf of everybody joining us, whether you're watching this later on or if you're watching with us live, that this uh, panel's insight is truly something for us to reflect upon, not only for today, uh, but for many, many years to come. And I'm looking forward to reflecting on this uh, with everybody who joined us today. Thank you very much, Sirpa uh, for answering that question as well. And thank you, a big, big thank you to uh, all of our beloved panelists who did such a great job. Uh, dear Diran, thank you again for uh, moderating this discussion because there's definitely a lot of angles to uh, take take with, uh, with with this type of a topic um, in terms of efforts in Artsakh, but um, you, you did a fantastic job and we're, we're looking forward to uh, hearing from our next panel soon. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Deacon Levon. You did this very eloquently and uh, very well. Uh, I apologize again for the technical problems, error 2E, uh, whatever that means. Uh, <laughs> Again, uh, this was a very wonderful panel. Thank you all my co-panelists for bringing these different perspectives, you know, from farming, agriculture, to engineering, building, uh, uh, pastoral care and counseling, uh, serving as deacons and churches being the stronghold. This is a holistic approach and I think we have to continue towards this direction. Uh, and Again, there is so much we can do. There is so much we can do. I don't, I don't want to continue further, but uh, I think it is very appropriate that we uh, close this panel with another quote from Mother Teresa. Uh, you know, during our preparations uh, in the emails, we discussed also ways and means how we can help, you know, beyond the triple T, you know, our treasures, our talents, our time. What can we do beyond that? And uh, Mother Teresa says, you know, if you're not able to do works of mercy to the poor on the street, find someone to love behind the closed doors of your own home. If you take a good look at your relationship, you will quickly find someone that would like your attention. It could be your spouse, your child, parent, sibling, or a roommate. Reach out to them, love them, make a gift of yourself to them. And, you know, she served in uh, India predominantly. And she says that find your own Calcutta. Find the sick, the suffering, and the lonely right where you are in your own homes, in your own families, in your workplace, in your school. You can find Calcutta all over the world if you have eyes to see. I think this is. A beautiful closure and uh, thank you again, panelists, and uh, thank you, Deacon Levon. Thank you, Ter Vazgen, for this opportunity, and of course, our beloved Surpazan Hari. Thank you, Diran, once again. Um, and again, well said. Uh, Diran, out of a lot of panelists, I mean, everybody on this panel is very modest, but I know Diran to be uh, very modest himself. Uh, Diran was actually a graduate of the St. James Theological Seminary of the Armenian Patriarchate in Jerusalem. So uh, a lot of his uh, knowledge uh, was not just knowledge that came from his head, but it's rather knowledge that he applied. He invested himself into the Armenian church in the same way that a lot of us are uh, being challenged today to do as well. I mean, it's not always going to be by pursuing seminarian studies or, uh, you know, by serving on the altar, but we can all serve the body of Christ in different ways. You know, we mentioned agriculture and all these uh, uh, different facets that we can serve God in and uh, in the medical field or, or beyond that. Um, it, it's important to uh, keep in mind that service to Christ, service to his people uh, doesn't look the same for everyone. Um, so thank you for sharing that, Diran. Thank you so much. Thank you. Let me go ahead and um, we will transition our discussion to panel discussion number three.